Hey, welcome back to Unschool Theology. I am one of your hosts, Eric. With me is Evan. Good day to you, sir. Good day to you, sir. All right, we are diving in with Genesis 2.24. We are almost done with Genesis 2. Almost done with two chapters. This is Some, exciting. You know, 60 plus odd episodes. We're almost, we're almost through two. There we go. There we go. Uh, all right, so 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This verse is in a lot of uh, church's statements of faith. Indeed, it is, yes. Um, so as an initial point, right, I just want to say that what we're sort of going to discuss here in this episode, uh, this is from a Christian perspective, right? And it's an argument for why Christians, arguing perhaps, you know, against these perspectives, um, do so from a source that is not Christianity, right? Um, that's sort of what will come at on this. Um, if the one isn't a Christian, I mean, I, I certainly stand by the idea that perhaps there are arrangements, let's say, that are outside of God's order, right, in which all humanity was meant to operate. Um, but we are all afforded the choice to not conform with that order, right? That's, that's, we have free will. Uh, that is one of the messages of the Bible as well. And so if, if, you know, if we so desire not to conform, then so be it, right? Um, there's nothing in here in, in our discussion that to me is meant to persuade a non-Christian to see these ideas and subjects any differently because you're not coming from the same sort of foundational framework, so it makes sense. Um, that said, uh, if anyone wishes to take offense to any of what is discussed, uh, first of all, I'll say that's odd. We're, uh, we're two random guys talking theology on an internet show that no one's making you watch. So uh, if the courage of your convictions is so minimal that it can't handle that, then perhaps I would, I would recommend spending some time examining your convictions. Uh, so yeah, so that's sort of just an intro. Um, okay, here we see the institution of marriage set up. Right. Um, and I, again, I just want to point out again, we mentioned it, it's not like a big, big point of this, but uh, we talked about how, you know, this verse starts out with kind of a therefore or, a, you know, because of what was said in the previous verse. And we talked about that jubilation of sort of the, the wholeness, right, that Adam, that the man, not, not even yet Adam, but that the man feels in being reunited with the woman, mm -hmm. uh, which is a reuniting with the fullness of what it means to be human, I guess, um, but in a way that is even better than before he was split. Uh, if you have any questions about what we're talking about here, just check out the few previous episodes where we examine those strange ideas. Can I, can I connect that just for one yeah. sec with yeah. the idea of one flesh? Because you're seeing this, I, I've heard this idea of one flesh over and over and over and over again growing up in the church. Um, it's never been brought to light in the context of the previous verses and the way we talked about those. So I think oh, that right. is important to emphasize what you just talked about, because we've talked about how when Adam is split apart, it's his, it's not his, or when he is split apart, it's not his rib that comes out. It's, mm -hmm. it's more accurately described as his side, which split means it's almost two. him yeah. split in two two new humans almost come out of that, the old, and then the new thing is built up around that, and that becomes woman. And this reconnecting of the two is this idea of one flesh becomes, no, look, you, you were one flesh, you were ripped apart. Mm -hmm. And now you have to figure out a way to become one again, in order to actually become the whole thing that you were intended to be from the get go. It makes sex symbolically very important. Yes. Right. Yeah, and it, yeah. and it's sort of to extend it out. I mean, that's fine. Let's jump into the, the one flesh. Aspect. We'll jump to the end of the verse. We'll jump into the I'm one sorry, flesh. I, aspect. I, I, no, no, it's what fine. You're talking about it. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, no, yeah, it, yeah. it's fine. Let's let's jump in there. It's um, it it also explains the prohibitions against adultery. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because, no, this 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 act is about this uniting this reuniting this sort of becoming one right mm -hmm. um and it's like we you, but you can't like become one with like you know seven people that's not <laughs> that's not how it works it's mm -hmm. it's meant to be you know a partnership where now you were you were two and you become one um it is that stitching back together 
right? And so that that describes sort of the the symbolism that of all things are symbolic. So the sexual act has an element of symbolism to it, right? This um, is fairly profound then too, with because uh, we talked about in that episode too. I'm going to rehash briefly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we no. talked about the Platonic idea literally from Plato, one of his dialogues, I can't remember which, but the idea of soulmates and his concept of soulmates were such that humans initially had four legs and right. and four right. arms and they were, you know, two humans sewn together. And that at some point along the way, they got ripped in half and the attempt to find a soulmate in the very earliest form of that idea from Plato was that they needed to reunite with the part that had been re- when they ripped apart apart. exactly so his idea is a coming together of one flesh here too which is Mm -hmm. just it's very interesting when two ideas like that rhyme because plato very clearly didn't i think it's well established didn't have any sort of hebrew influence they're they're not even close to close geographically Mm -hmm. um, at least given the time frame time period there's not going to be an interchange of cultures going on there so that's very that's very interesting that they end up with this very similar idea that truth be told it seems that we might have been looking at inaccurately as the church yeah not not close yes. enough really looking at the mm-hmm. idea of it was a ripped apart human being and the reestablishing of what marriage is intended to be is 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 the wholeness of humanity as humanity is intended to be right and and, and perhaps that idea is not plato's but rather you know uh some sort of tradition that was was sent down you know through the ages coming from of course you know the same source here as the biblical story right you know and of so course. it's not it's not his idea he put he put it a pen to paper you know um yeah but yeah well, but it, it, it was possibly. you know a, sort of an oral idea that had been sort of passed along that he mm-hmm. he ran into in his days and, and then mm-hmm. put it in into a, a narrative so um yeah. yeah no that's that's very much the case and i guess if we must we'll we'll dive into now the uh this is so that this later marriage comes to symbolize something else with Christ and the church and all of that. Um, and, and we'll get to that when we, we get to that part of the Bible. But I, I think it's worthwhile to consider um, what this passage would have meant long before Christ. You know, like it, it, we understand now the importance of marriage through this idea of the relationship with Christ and his bride, the church. Mm-hmm. But that before there was Christ and the church, there was clearly some understanding of what marriage meant, right? Why it existed, why there was this sort of symbolic significance to it. And I think it's worthwhile to consider that idea, which we've kind of been discussing here, um, because I think if we, if we jump immediately to marriage and Christ in, in that way, I think we actually kind of cheapen the symbolism of marriage a little bit, Right. Because if we understand this idea of marriage, that it's sort of, again, this reuniting of something that was split in two, right? That, uh, that influences then how I think of the idea of Christ's relationship with this church, you know? Like we almost see marriage as a little bit of a deeper thing then in that, in that way. And we understand our relationship with Christ a little bit, a little bit different, you know? Um, given that I think the, the, you know, the idea of, of Christ, uh, you know, marriage with the church, it, it, it's founded upon the Old Testament. Everything that Christ did is founded upon the Old Testament um, because that's where he, he came from. So um, yeah, it's Christ represents a completion of things. That's what he always yes. emphasizes. And yes. Not, uh, and yeah, the either. patterns. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's, it's the, it's, it's, it's expected that he would, that he would rhyme with these things, but these things existed before he manifested, mm-hmm. as I'll say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Speaking of patterns, now we get to the more controversial part of this, uh, this episode, but um, this is, I mean, the, the point here is, is in terms of marriage, it is established here that the pattern of marriage is the reuniting, the union of the man and the woman, right? The reuniting of the flesh, the coming together, in fact, uh, you know, uh, to get as minimally graphic as possible. Uh, they're designed with puzzle pieces that fit together. <laughs> let's, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, the puzzle pieces are meant to work together. And so that is the pattern that is established here, right? And so, 
you know, there is a movement in, in some parts of, of, I don't know, some, some variants of Christianity, let's call it, uh, to not view marriage in, in those terms anymore, right? But there's no point at which we see the, the breaking of this pattern, right? The idea that, no, that the, the pattern is actually meant to be something different or something else, you know? Um, that's, that's not what we see, you know? The, this is the pattern that is established. Again, I mean, I think that only matters in people's minds if they are Christian, right? If you're Christian, then you care about this particular pattern, what it should be, or you should do that if you're a Christian. Um, if not, I understand, you know, this is, there's all sorts of impulses and feelings and sentiments that people have. And so they act outside of the pattern and to them, it's not act, acting outside of a pattern. And so that will be what it is. But um, for a Christian, I think you have to go look at where the pattern is established, which is here. <laughs> Um, and that is the, the, the pure form of the pattern, right? And, and I, that's, you know, kind of what we see in as Christians where we're always seeking to be the purest form of the patterns because that's what God had decided. So that's why we would say, eh, this is, this is kind of how the pattern is supposed to work. Man, woman coming together, puzzle pieces fit. Just kind of what marriage is. <laughs> that's, it's kind of the, the definition of it. So yeah, that's uh, in this verse, let's put it that way, the, the sort of the, the uniting. Yeah, and we spoke yesterday, for, we, or we spoke um, on our previous episode about, uh, about this situation in which man uh, and sort of humanity as a whole names themselves and therefore takes individual responsibility for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I think it's important after just hearing that said that to emphasize what you're saying that this is this is something that is an individual taking responsibility for for what they're what they what they're supposed to do and so right. this says very clearly therefore a man it doesn't say humanity is intended to leave and hold fast to his wife it's very yeah no i you know what i want to i want to highlight that specifically because we talked last episode about how that was the first time that the individual man was used Mm -hmm. And in fact, it is not used again until we see God talking to uh, Eve, the woman, after the serpent's temptation and all of that. The rest of the narrative goes back to a more broadly uh, term human, not a, a man, you know, broadly, right? Mm -hmm. Man is in males, men, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, here, it is the only other time in, in verse two and three outside of that one in, in 316, I believe it is that it is the individual man that is mm -hmm. described, right? Mm -hmm. So that goes to bolster what you're saying. It is about the individual, you know, it's not about humanity or men more broadly. It is the individual man uh, unites with the individual woman, not mm -hmm. women, you know, mm -hmm. it is very much uh, that in terms of the, the language that's used. So when it comes down to it, the, uh, the real contention that I think we run is this is, let me start with the issue the church has had. I think the issue the church has had for the longest time is that it's viewed it as it is going to be an infection in society and an infection in culture. And maybe that is the case. Maybe it's not I mean, the case. Whatever you sin think, has a way of has a way of making things worse, culture. you know, as, as we'll see at the end of the next chapter. Correct. But the question then becomes is what is this saying? This is speaking to individuals saying it is your responsibility to take this. We're going to give you the instruction. This is how you're intended to do things. But in terms of enforcing that on other people, that that becomes more gray. This seems to well, be something of saying, look, God's God's d directing you and saying this is how things seem. This is how things are designed. Mm -hmm. And this is how you follow that design and structure. But he's speaking to a man doing this and not saying, therefore, you force men to do this. Yeah, that is the Somebody mistake of giving the idea of marriage to the state, which is uh, to the government, which is a that's an institution of humanity. That's right. not the church, right? right. The marriage that's is something that that is the churches. I mean, it's established here in Eden, right? Not outside of Eden, not after the fall. It's established in Eden in the in the sort of the zone of perfection or whatever you want to call it, right? That's the proper order of things. That should be something the church keeps for itself, not just says, yeah, government, 
what government says about that that's really important yeah. no what, what government says about it is is not important this is this is the church's domain you know yeah. um yeah and so that's why i think the contentions yeah. around gay marriage very quickly fell apart as soon as you saw church attendance change and you saw people's mm -hmm. people's um faith change um because that kind of revealed that look that was just the church using the state in order to enforce things and it's like no this is not the way this message is being given right this message is being given to individuals saying look this is the right way that you're supposed to do things yes it's not yes. your job as the church to go tell everybody to do that that way right uh, maybe maybe to share that this is how you see sure things yeah i mean to be. share but, share but what not, is not you know, enforce quote unquote, the, that yeah. upon other people yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And that's Should, what's significant here. Tell people the righteous path, uh -huh. but you know, nowhere in the Bible do I see uh, I, I see a point at which we are meant to you know force people onto the righteous path. I, I don't. I would argue you can't do that. I don't think that's a meaningful thing. Um, you you can't change people's hearts. Mm -hmm. Their hearts change, uh, you know, of their own accord. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the Holy Spirit alone does that. So, um, yeah, that's uh, yeah. That the idea that uh, this should be the foundation for the governmental action, the use of governmental force, doesn't make much sense. But this, uh, but what the church did is they they uh, tossed pearls before swine. They they um, oh, what else is in that verse? The the dog, right? You 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 don't give that what to sacred to a dog, basically. And frankly, that's what that's what Christians did. They 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 should have been arguing against. Uh, the, the government being involved in marriage. And frankly, if you do look at the history of marriage licensures, um, there was much zeal in uh, at least nominally Christian uh, realms for government involvement in it as a means of preventing interracial marriage, mm -hmm. right? And that's, so yeah, that's what happens when you, when you screw up, when you, when you put pearls before swine, Perfect. guess what happens, you know? <laughs> I mean, or guess what? That the you know the dog destroys that which is you know sacred and, and good, and that's what happens. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, anyways, that is I don't know. That's that's about all I have on this verse for now. I you know I've, marriage I've, gets expressed more later, but uh, one more thing. I have one other thing that I that I can't that I, I just I can't avoid seeing, and I want to yeah see if you have thoughts on it. It says therefore a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Why is it not a wife will leave her father and mother and hold fast to the man? Oh, I tend right. to I tend to look at this, right. and I don't know if I don't know where you would go with this, but I tend to look at it as the man. We talked about the man being unformed and the woman being the act. The 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 woman tends to form the man into something, forces forces them to become something. So as opposed to, wallowing. I think it's framed that way for a cultural reason because it it that is in contrast to the cultural norm. Right. Mm -hmm. So the cultural norm, and you can think about this in, in the other Jewish parts of, of the Bible or not Jewish parts of um, uh, just Genesis. Right. If we think of um, think of uh, Isaac, uh, think of uh, uh, Jacob. Right. Jacob as well. Jacob's probably actually Jacob's the best example. Jacob goes and finds a wife. Mm -hmm. Right. But the cultural norm was for them to leave and come back with Jacob to his father and mother's tents. That's where he returned. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the norm in the, in the Hebrew culture and some of the other cultures in the area was that, well, no, the woman leaves, right? That's, that's not a big deal. That's, that's what they do. The, the, the man stays in his parents' tents until he gets his inheritance, which basically just means he gets his parents tense i mean that's that's sort of how that works right you get the inheritance when they kick the bucket so that's that's kind of the idea so it being presented this way it demonstrates the the depth of the unity of marriage right mm -hmm. you don't need to specify the woman leaving her family because we already understand that's what goes on that's just understood that is that is the way marriage works in the culture but the idea of him, and in fact, actually, the word where it says leaves, uh, there's an argument that it might be better translated as forsakes. Hmm. 
which is even more interesting, right? Yeah. My God, my yeah, God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even you know, this is a this is a really interesting idea of forsakes. It yeah. really means no, separate yourself. It means your commitment to your wife needs to be so deep that you be willing to abandon your inheritance that what yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. and it is it is the primary commitment no longer is the primary commitment the commitment to the mother and father you need to be willing to forsake that leave that inheritance leave all that behind if need be for the sake of the wife right that is the depth of the unity that is then described there yeah that's not culturally uncommon i guess first of all that 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 uh that that's still common sometimes in cultures today but even going back 80 years, uh, going back to the mid 20th century. Mm-hmm. That's very common amongst a lot of cultures. Um, I can't imagine. I, I've not heard that interpretation or that looking of this verse in that way. And I can't imagine how many, uh, <laughs> how many wives would like to use that against their mother's-in-law uh, in certain circumstances. Yeah, right. right. To be able to, <laughs> to be able to say, it's, look, it's time, like, to, it's, it's time to it's forsake time to, them. Let's it's move, time on. To move on. What are you talking yeah. about? You know, yeah. Um, no, but, it, but, but that is that really speak. I mean, that speaks it, to they what they wouldn't be wrong is. in using that, right? They wouldn't. They wouldn't entirely. I mean, no, they'd they be wrong wouldn't. in using it. You know, in some circumstances, but in some I'm circumstances, they wouldn't be wrong in pointing to this verse and pointing to this idea that no, no, marriage is. You need to. That's not number one anymore, right? Grow this up. is now the priority. This union right here Grow is up. the primary union. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is one of the first defenses against, uh, or I guess one of the first instances where we're even insinuated at the idea of the over, symbolically the overprotective mother, the yeah. the the the, the, yeah. the crushing of a of a child by the fact that that somebody won't let them grow up, right? And right. saying, you know, that's a different way of reading this verse. And the just, father too. I mean, I mean, just inheritances the, would be held over kids' heads to allow to to cause abuse of kinds. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I mean, one could argue, going back to Jacob, his father-in-law did that, right? Um, uh, Laban, I believe it's, uh, it's biblical names always tough. Laban, Laban. <laughs> yes, Laban doesn't want him to leave and tries to do everything he can to prevent him to leave using what holding the the dowry the and, and the the inheritance if you will over his head right and yeah. so it's not just the overbearing mother it's also the father who you know abuses the the power of the inheritance right um yeah. but well, it's saying even in that case you need to leave it we collectively see that we shouldn't be too unfamiliar with this though because we collectively see this um generationally yes with, with baby boomers at this moment because yes. boomers hold and a disproportionate amount. I've got an art, wealth, article I'm which, working on on this, actually. which we don't <laughs> yeah. really, yeah, yeah, which we don't talk about very often when we talk about, uh, you know, wealth disparities. We like to focus yes. on the individuals who hold a lot, which you can talk about. But the thing that's under talked about is the fact that that generationally, mm-hmm. there's there's a hostage mm-hmm. holding that's going on at the moment, and it's no, the, like, the look, share, you need to... the share of wealth being held by those uh, forty and under. Mm-hmm. In other words just, you know, whatever that pot is of people 40 and under versus older, um, the share of wealth held within that pool has been cut in half in the last 30, 35 years. Mm-hmm. And that's so and that it's means, not because of avocado toast. Yeah, no, no. You know, it's the majority of wealth is is sitting in retirement accounts, you know, and yeah. and, um, and yeah. There's, I, I have much to say on that. The article will be out by this time, so I will link it uh, in the show notes. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm working on something on that front too. But you're right; it works. It works both sort of on the individual level and sort of on the the broader humanity level, right? That yeah. this commitment this... sort of supersedes by by saying you know leaves his mother and father. We could just say you know that could even more broadly be thought of as 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 the past. You know, you leave the past, you leave those things which you you held dear in the past, which were important to you uh, for the sake of this this new commitment. Right. This This is is now the primary commitment you have. Yeah. And this is the commitment that's given to Abraham, though. Abraham sitting in his father's Mm -hmm. tent and and Mm -hmm. God comes to him and says, look, you're you're 65 years old. Get up and leave. Yeah. Like go somewhere else and do something. Yeah. You know, and this insistence that you're going to leave behind, forsake your father and mother yep. and hold fast to, to your wife. You're going to, to, to have to 
to completely forget that stuff and go yeah. on and actually make something. Yeah. That's significant. That that's mm -hmm. what this that's what this union's designed for. This union is is designed for you to move forward. It's not to be yes. completely dragged down by everything that's back here. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. The union is is definitely a part of moving moving things forward, moving God's order forward, all of that. Yeah. yeah. Very much. That's that's represented i guess in this oh. so all right with that we'll be back next time be sure to like subscribe uh rumble us on rumble uh share it with your friends sign up for the email newsletter in the show notes email us uh unschooled theology at protonmail.com if this episode got any kind of a buzz i'm sure we've got some hate mail coming that way and uh yeah be sure to uh tune in next time and we will see you then <laughs>